Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. One of the most promising upcoming battery chemistries is sodium ion, which, thanks to its use of cheap and abundant sodium instead of lithium, should reduce the cost of batteries by 30% or more. But what's often less known about sodium ion batteries is that the United States could be the ideal place to scale the sodium ion industry because we have the largest reserves of sodium carbonate in the world by orders of magnitude. So to get a better understanding of sodium ion batteries and how the industry is evolving, I reached out to Shirley Mung, who's a chief scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. Let's get into it. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, YouTube members, and Twitter subscribers, as well as Rebellionaire.com. They specialize in helping investors manage concentrated positions. Rebellionaire can help with covered calls, risk management, and creating a money master plan from your financial first principles. First, thanks for making the time to chat today. It's always a real privilege to talk to you. Pleasure to be here, Jordan. So you hold several positions at UC San Diego, UC San Diego, University of Chicago, and Argonne National Laboratory. Could you walk us through how those roles intersect with uh, sodium ion batteries? Of course, yeah. I'm like a delocalized electrons, all these places at the same time. <laughs> yeah, so I spent uh, 12 years as a professor in University of California, San Diego, uh, until 2021. And uh, in fact, the uh, majority of the uh, basis of sodium battery research in my group was built in UC San Diego. Uh, about two years ago, I took the job at the University of Chicago. Uh, at the same time, served as the chief scientist for Argonne National Labs Collaborative Center for Energy Storage Science. So the goal is that... Uh, uh, to move the research for sodium battery research, uh, battery related materials and electrolyte and the systems to a bigger scale. And I certainly hope uh, in the near future that there will be uh, you no know, more details of the plan that will be reviewed, but it's precisely because the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory will provide a bigger platform where we can um, accelerate the research for sodium batteries. That was one of the reasons that I moved from San Diego to Chicago. Okay. And is that, what's, uh, what's driving that? Is this, uh, have uh, University of uh, Chicago and UC San Diego, is this two independently have decided to do this, or is this being orchestrated more broadly um, by the Department of Energy or something like that? So, Earlier in the days, for example, 2010, when I received the National Science Foundation Career Award, um, I wrote the proposal about sodium batteries in 2010. And uh, yeah, at that time, uh, the topic is was not mainstream, and a lot of people were doubtful about the impact of sodium batteries. Yeah, so uh, after 10 years, I'm confident to say, you know, uh, we also spin out the company Unigrid. Um, I think later we'll uh, dive deeper into what Unigrid is doing. But at the, right now, I would say that uh, probably is because the work we are doing in UCSD uh, were recognized by many researchers in the world or even Department of Energy. I think uh, people seeing uh, there is a real potential impact uh, for the sodium batteries to scale and uh, to, uh, you know, enter both the mobility and the stationary storage. Yeah, so I think uh, it's not exactly synchronized, but I always uh, believe in destiny. So <laughs> I think the first 12 years of hard work, uh, now we can really try to do something at scale. That's fantastic. So you're really ahead of the curve on that. So could you walk us through the strengths and weaknesses as of sodium ion as a chemistry? Of course, yeah. So let me speak of a little bit of history of sodium batteries. I think a lot of people don't recognize that uh, uh, before lithium iron, we have sodium iron batteries. Uh, actually, the 1960s, you know, when the whole world was experiencing oil embargo and uh, uh, the battery research uh, 
that time, uh, French scientists actually a lot of them were working on sodium ion batteries. One of the most uh, uh, well recognized one is Professor Claude Damas from University of Bordeaux. Uh, in fact, his early thesis in the 1960s is all on the layered. Uh, oxide for sodium intercalation. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, maybe the thesis was not di digitized. A lot of people didn't have a chance to read it, but I had the pleasure actually visiting Professor Damas back in 2005 before I decided to go again to do sodium batteries. I want people to recognize that, uh, uh, you know, at that time we were not, uh, we did not succeed in making sodium ion batteries um, and then lithium actually overtake you know starting 70s professor Whittingham published this lithium metal with titanium disulfide and suddenly the whole world recognized the potential of lithium ion batteries but sodium ion batteries were actually around for a very long time and from 1990s to the uh, 2010 there were almost no research funding um, in the area of sodium batteries. Yeah, so let's talk about the, the strengths and the weakness. So um, the strengths for sodium batteries, uh, um, I think the, in the group one of periodic table, I think everybody knows hydrogen, lithium, and the below lithium is sodium. Yeah, so sodium is the bigger ion. Um, actually, the abundance of sodium is magnitude higher than lithium. So a lot of the sodium uh, ash deposits are widely available in the United States, um, and the distribution of the sodium is also less uh, sparsely distributed like uh, lithium. Um, so I think uh, sodium's biggest strength is its uh, uh, abundancy. The second strength, that I think people, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive because a bigger ion, people always think the ions will move slowly. It is absolutely not true. And I can give a whole class about why uh, actually sodium ions um, can have a very high mobilities because of its uh, the way how its electronic structure is and how it is arranged in the intercalation compounds. So typically lithium, the oxides will be more closely packed, but if you have sodium in it, actually the oxide will be less closely packed. It will be more loosely packed. So the diffusion channels for the sodium will be bigger, much bigger. So sodium actually can move really, really quickly. So I think that's actually, to me, the second strength for sodium is that it can really enable fast charging and fast discharge. It can be a very powerful batteries. Yeah. And then the weakness, I think sodium, unfortunately, its standard electrochemical potential is slightly lower than that of lithium. So typically voltage is not that at this four volt, you know, um, air, like range. And the sodium also suffers a little bit because it is a bigger ion. So uh, it occupies more space, right? So volumetric energy density is lower. Uh, but I later we can talk about how can we actually make sodium batteries same energy density as the graphite LFP. I think many calculations have shown that it can be achieved. Uh, so, you know, given the sodium's weakness of uh, lower energy density uh, and a little bit lower potential, I think the uh, only possibility for sodium to compete, I wouldn't say compete, to complement what uh, lithium can do, uh, probably we should really focus on the really super long cycle life. Um, you know, I think that's something sodium battery field, we have to figure it out how we make the case for users, instead of choosing LFP, you're going to choose uh, sodium batteries. Yeah. Now, one thing that I've seen mentioned previously is that uh, the round trip efficiency might not be as good. Is that just because, uh, is that actually the case? And uh, is that something that'll just be resolved as the technology matures? Mm. Yeah, so I think that because there's a gap of 20 years of lacking of research uh, activities in sodium. Yeah, so in the old days, yes, the round trip efficiency or the voltage efficiency may not be great, but I do think that we made a lot of progress already. Today, I think the uh, efficiencies can be as good as that of lithium ion uh, if you uh, kind of make the cells as good quality as of the lithium 
batteries. Um, sodium also, I would say the uh, variety of the sodium materials is still lacking. You know, unlike uh, lithium, you have LFP, LNMO, NMC, LCO. Yeah, so in the sodium, the cathode materials choices are very limited. Uh, and then for a while, a lot of people were studying so-called Persian blue or Persian white type of intercalation materials. Um, those energy density and round trip efficiencies are not as good as layered oxide. Um, I think nowadays um, the uh, layered oxide and also the French group, uh, um, the company Tiamat specialized in um, vanadium phosphate, uh, multi-valent uh, um, anion uh, cathode, and then those are having excellent, excellent round-trip efficiencies and the voltage efficiencies. What's the current state of sodium ion battery chemistry in terms of uh, technology readiness level? Is this mostly a solved problem, or uh, when can we expect to see sodium ion batteries really hitting the market in scale? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, um, from what I know, the activities happening in China, uh, their technology readiness level is very high. I'm talking about seven, eight, you know, and the two already trying to scale from megawatt hour to gigawatt hour is being planned and that probably in process has been executed. Um, I think the downside of this um, very quick commercializations is that I, when I look at their current chemistry, they're using hard carbon and then a kind of layered oxide that is using similar precursors that are coming from the lithium. So as you know, NMC or uh, you know, the lithium materials use the co-precipitation method of making a layered oxide. So they are trying to leverage the infrastructure that's built for all the lithium intercalation compounds to make the sodium intercalation compounds. So when you combine these two, uh, the challenge is, of course, some of those cathode materials have very slopey, like, you know, quickly decline voltage curve. And then Combining with the hard carbons, extremely fluffy, you know, low vo volumetric energy density. So the overall energy density of the sodium ion batteries that generation one that China is releasing to the market uh, will only be suitable for very low end e-mobility uh, and very, you know, maybe stationary storage that you don't need a lot of uh, um, energy density requirement. Uh, so. For that uh, generation one, I think uh, uh, it's ready. It's commercially ready. And uh, we heard through the grapevine that probably gigawatt scale already being executed in China. Um, in other parts of the world, I would say that uh, uh, there's this constraint about the resources, you know, how much effort you put on lithium productions versus sodium. So um, I think that, uh, um, you know, we're still seeing, uh, in my opinion, too little activities in both Europe and the North America about the sodium battery research because most of the effort and most of the resources are poured into how we secure our lithium battery supplies first. Uh, so I would say, uh, unfortunately, you know, today you can still cannot buy the market, buy it on the market, right, for the sodium batteries uh, in U.S. particularly. Um, I hope uh, in the next two years or three years, the situation will be changed. Um, yeah, I am optimistic about it. All right. So. There, if, in your view, there's no real showstoppers for sodium ion batteries. It's just a matter of shifting investment and resources to sodium ion batteries to really start scaling it. I think there is a showstopper. The show, the real showstopper is that we decided that we are not going for energy transition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, let me be more serious about it. The the showstopper right now is the crashing mineral price of nickel and the lithium. Um, all the companies who are betting on the sodium batteries, uh, the investment companies are betting on the uh, ever rising price of lithium and the nickel. Um, I think that's you know, understandable, but probably not, not the most uh, uh, strategic approach um, because 
the true um, drivers for sodium should be um, the security of supply chain. Um, and, you know, as we build those machineries for gigafactories, for uh, making of precursor solid state, solid, solid uh, uh, cathode materials, those infrastructure, when you, once you build, uh, ideally you should be switching between the chemistries. So how wonderful it is that, like you could actually do lithium when the supplies are there, when you do sodium when the supply of materials are there. So then the factories can run 24 seven. As you know, we, Jordan, we all read the Tesla's master plan and my own group's number is the same. The whole world will need 200 to 300 terawatt hour batteries to uh, secure the energy transition. That's given if hydrogen is successful. Uh, hydrogen have to come to successful. And even that we will need a couple hundred terawatt hour battery. And today we only have like what, two terawatt hour production capacities. So when when we look at this picture, the major driver for me is that a lot of places will have to build infrastructure for building batteries, regardless it's lithium chemistry or sodium chemistry. And it's wonderful if we can have a very um, robust supply chain of the different chemistries and utilizing similar manufacturing facilities to build those batteries. And I think the recycling facility should be the similar, like we should be able to be very versatile towards what materials we're working on because you know they are all layered oxides. They are all alkaline metals. The chemistry have, I think there's a lot of similarities there. And how far would you say the U.S. is behind uh, China and other uh, countries with with sodium ion chemistries? And I I think it's particularly important for the U.S. because we're so dependent on China's supply chain for mm -hmm. lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we should really be pushing as as, as hard as possible on uh, to diversify and uh, create stability. Uh, so, so how far behind would you say we are and what are we doing to grow the sodium ion battery supply chain here? Yeah, I have to say uh, when I was uh, graduating from MIT 2005, China was learning from us in U.S., right? So I've been in this field so long. So I think it's about persistency and the willingness to invest the time and the resources. It's not far at all we are behind. However, it's this consistent, um, you know, instead of looking inwards, we're always looking for reasons, oh, why we didn't do well, because China, blah, 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 China, blah, blah, blah. And I was always say, why don't we examine inwards? Like, what did we, what could we do better to catch up? So, so I think the timeline, number one, is the lack of patience from many uh, large companies is concerning because they all wanted to, in two to three years, to completely turn around the ship. Uh, I think that's unrealistic. You know, the China, uh, there's a reason why uh, Japan, South Korea, and China are leading because their company and the government takes decades to position themselves as the world leaders. Uh, and I think the determination here is that, okay, 20 years later, can you imagine in 2040, 2020, 2045, who will be the leader? Because for me, um, the game is just starting, right? So if I think about I need a 200 terawatt hour, right now the whole world have three terawatt hour batteries. We are less than 2% complete. And then the rest of 98%, who are going to be the big players and who will be the winner? And I think there'll be many winners if people just focus on how to get things executed and how do we every time hit the milestones and the KPIs and to move the... Um, you know, move forward instead of always thinking about, oh, what happened to China? What did we do wrong? I think it's a very frustrating for me to see so many uh, kind of resources, the energy putting on how we uh, kind of prevent, I would say that, uh, you know, interaction with China instead of thinking about uh, how can we do better? How can we push the field forward? And then, you know, it's it's a, should be a friendly competition. You know, the real comp competition is with oil and the gas, right? We are all trying to do the right things to uh, utilize more renewables and to make a battery itself more sustainable and a more lower carbon footprint. And all of us know based on the numbers from Asia, this is the area we can all improve. So 
when you have a sodium batteries or when you have a solid state batteries, these are all golden opportunities for us to think about the manufacturing process, the robust supply chains. Yeah, so I would really like to say that uh, the game is still on. You know, think about the energy transition by 2050. Uh, we have 27 years left. Uh, long game. Yeah, I hope people realize that it's a marathon. It's not a 100 meter sprint we're doing here. Yeah, uh, and a lot of people that I've interacted with or talked to, they think this is going to happen in about five to 10 years, but this is something that we still have plenty of time to tackle this. We just need to engage the problem rather than taking a more defensive approach. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. All right. All right. So what I'll do now, I'm going to shift into some more technical questions. I sure. don't know if you have the answers to these, but there, there's things that have been playing on my mind. Um, could just because I have a, a fascination with things to do with the supply chain. So first off, is sodium cheaper to refine than battery grade lithium? That's absolutely right. Yeah, because the sodium um, are present in the format of carbonate and hydroxide readily. You don't need to concentrate too much in some sodium ash deposits in United States. Yeah, so... I think that the price, if you look at them per metric ton price, <laughs> there's three magnitude order differences in price for the lithium versus sodium precursor. On that note, when we when we move along to from uh, processing uh, the sodium to actually making the cathode that goes into the, into the battery cells, uh, manufacturing high nickel lithium cathode material is notoriously difficult, is my understanding, because it's very reactive. Would sodium ion cathode material be easier to manufacture and work with? Um, yes and no. I think the <laughs> the no part is really because the quality of the cathode still have to be very high because the battery will be uh, operated around like three to four, between three to 3.6 volt. So still is way above where uh, most of the stability of the liquid electrolytes. So um, I think the quality control still is important. Uh, but no, I mean that uh, we really don't need the sodium cobalt oxide. Nobody will need to use cobalt, uh, a lot of cobalt in the sodium uh, intercalation materials. Uh, we may need to still use a little bit of nickel, um, but I think the main trend is to use cathode without cobalt or nickel so that we can actually, you know, really uh, eliminate this supply chain constraints for the sodium batteries. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I want to say, yeah, sodium battery also don't use copper current collector. Yeah, because sodium does not uh, alloy with lit, uh, aluminum in the low potential. So both electrodes will be on aluminum current collector. Yeah. So everything that goes into the battery cell is going to be dirt cheap. Everything that you use in is going to be highly available and uh, relative relative to lithium ion batteries. Relative, yeah. I think the quality control is still needed, and then the electrolyte is the key. In fact, the electrolyte uh, for sodium, you know, it still needs to be very dry, just like lithium, because the um, potential is still way above the water. Um, decomposition pro uh, voltage, right? So I think uh, uh, electrolyte is still quite important. Now, you've mentioned power, uh, charging speed and discharging speed for sodium ion a few times. And uh, I'll, I'll take a moment here to digress here a little bit because I'm curious about that. What kind of charge rates can you expect for sodium ion batteries as opposed to lithium ion batteries? Um, I think here we're really talking about the, the dreams about five to six minutes charging, discharging. Yeah. So 15 to 20 C uh, kind of power capabilities. Yeah. Um, I can explain it a little bit because the electrolyte uh, used in the sodium uh, is different from lithium. Yeah. So you have a different uh, solvent and the solvation structure of the salt is different. And uh, I hope uh, people will actually study more interesting science in this area and the realizing that uh, that salvation architecture change will change the way how sodium ion is transported through electrolyte and then particularly from the electrolyte to electrode interface. Uh, we found really uh, fascinating uh, evidences about how that process is very different from that of lithium. 
Um, and the other important thing I already mentioned in the solid state, the cathode can actually enable much faster rate because the structure of sodium integration compounds allows sodium to be in the so-called prismatic side. I think we did the video about the lithium where the lithium sits in the octahedral side of the oxides. So if your oxides are packed more loosely, you're going to open up so-called prismatic side for ion intercalation. And that ion, when they move, there's almost no activation barrier. So you can make a batteries um, fast charging and it can make batteries operate at a very low temperature. And those are all possibilities. All right. So you're giving me ideas for future videos now. Uh, so uh, uh, just to make sure I, I, I have this clear. So when I start following up, I'm asking the right questions. So uh, there's a few reasons why sodium ion batteries have uh, faster charge and discharge capabilities. One is the way that they're packed into the cathode crystal structure. And another is the solvent that's used in the electrode light. It's, uh, the solvation works differently, so it can happen more rapidly. Are those two correct so far? Yes, that's in okay. my, in my uh, knowledge. I think these are the two key uh, enabling factors. Okay. Now, uh, and this brings us to the anode side of things. Does the anode also play a role? Uh, I, because I, uh, my understanding is that sodium ion batteries don't use graphite, they use something else. So does that play a role? And could you uh, talk about I what that material is? explain yeah. a little bit of why it didn't work in the graphite for some of the electrolytes, okay? So the way how uh, carbonate electrolyte work with lithium is when it touches the graphite surface, the uh, lithium is going to desolvate from the carbonate and the carbonate elements will go through some decomposition process and form so-called SEI on the graphite interface. And uh, we, I think, you know, we had a lot of uh, um, uh, prior, you know, explanation of how the SEI works. Now, this whole process um, didn't work for sodium. The first of all is this dissolution did not happen properly. So you, if you just use carbonate with graphite using, you know, so-called sodium PF6 salts, it didn't work that well. So uh, the sodium actually cannot desolvate from the electrolyte and go into the graphite. And this is the, one of the reasons, but if you change to other solvent, actually sodium can intercalate into graphite. So never say, you know, sodium is too big to intercalate into graphite because potassium actually have no problem to intercalate into graphite. If you make a potassium batteries, potassium ion batteries, you still use graphite as the anode. You can use graphite. So this is really the magic role of uh, what we call the solvation desolvation from iron from electrolyte into the electrodes. Uh, hot carbon is used because the uh, I guess the convenience, you know, like a hot carbon is very easy to source. And it's basically, we call it hot carbon because it's basically disordered carbon, right? And uh, mm. uh, the problem with hot carbon, if people put one gram of graphite and one gram of hot carbon, like the volume difference would be huge because a hot carbon disordered carbon is really fluffy materials. So that actually severely limits the power, uh, the volumetric energy density of sodium ion batteries if people use hot carbon. Yeah, and then up to today, there's still debate about exactly what's the mechanism for uh, sodium versus hot carbon, uh, how sodium entered the hot carbon. I think there's a lot of uh, studies have shown that the sodium does intercalate into the hot carbon. Um, and it can be reversible. So I think the only problem is that hot carbon is really very poor volumetric energy density. It occupies a lot of volume and then hosts not a lot of sodium. So. All right. And so when when you're talking about this that disordered carbon structure, uh, I'll just explain that real quick as I understand it. Graphite it's it's stacked in nice sheets and nice layers, whereas hard carbon it's kind of it's it's tangled up. You still have those sheets, but they're it's just like a mess. It's like a, somebody you have uh, the sheets, but they are much smaller domains. They break up mm -hmm. and then they align. Yeah, you're right. A mess when they al align. Okay. Is, yeah. And that has a slightly different voltage too, doesn't it? Hard carbon is it a slightly different voltage potential? Okay, voltage potential different, and then you won't 
see these nice staging compounds in the lithium graphite case. Yeah, so okay. um, yeah, I think the mechanism is indeed quite different. And uh, um, yeah, I think hot carbon, although yeah, it does work quite well. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the first generation product, I think that there's no doubt hot carbon will be the first generation anode for uh, solar right. batteries. And and what's because uh, graphite you can make that from uh, oh uh, needle coke or you can get it naturally in the environment. What is hard carbon usually made from? Oh, so hard carbon. One of the reason it's so popular is the source of hard carbon is very broad. Yeah, sometimes people always say you can use coconut shell to make a hard carbon. It's possible. Yeah, but the carbon process making the hot carbon is still high temperature and it's pretty you know environmentally you know you make a lot of powder a lot of um yeah so i i do think that the process of making graphite probably consumes more energy even hot carbon may be slightly better yeah i haven't really dived deeper to get the exact numbers yet but i do think that the hot carbon uh, it's more widely available. You know, graphite, as you know, battery grade graphite is very, very difficult to make. Okay, so the hard carbon may be easier to scale. Easier to scale, yes. I, that right. will be my assessment. All right, so there's, I have a few more questions here. How are you doing on time right now? I'm doing good, yeah. I think we'll finish okay. on time. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get, uh, there's some uh, more exciting stuff, future looking, that I want to get into. Uh, because we're just looking at the the state of sodium ion batteries today and my understanding is that there's a lot of potential opportunities even though the the energy density of sodium sodium ion batteries is low there's ways that that can be improved so uh what is the prospect of higher energy density sodium ion batteries and how would that be done mm -hmm. yeah so um for sodium batteries so I think it's very important for people who work on the sodium batteries to make the energy density as good as the graphite LFP cells. So I think uh, uh, that will make a difference when people choose what batteries to uh, use. Um, the roadmap for sodium battery development, I think the uh, anode side um, is uh, on my list the top uh, priority. And I think that the reason why you know Unigrid, the startup company, spun out from my group, and they particularly focusing on anode innovation. So instead of using the very fluffy graphite, um, I think we decided to take the approach using alloy, so sodium-based uh, metal alloys that uh, you can actually find many in the periodic table. Um, I think that uh, the volume will be very dense because metals are usually much closely packed. Um, and that also, I would say, uh, could potentially, I think the numbers already there, we can show it can match the energy density of the graphite LFP. So that's one. The second one is I think we need to continue to search for new cathode materials for sodium ion batteries because at the moment uh, uh, the operation potential for example uh, 3.4 3.5 volt uh, i think there's a potential to go 4 volt or even higher there are such materials that waiting us to discover okay uh, man-made materials maybe not previously present um, the Third direction is really my favorite topic, which is to replace the liquid with solid and then enable anode-free sodium solid-state batteries. Uh, I did a little bit of the uh, you know, initial work. I think it's very exciting to see the volumetric energy density can potentially reach uh, 700 watt hour per liter. And that will, I think, really change the view how people look at the sodium batteries because the uh, volumetric energy density for anode-free um, uh, configurations. I think uh, I know it's very far out in the yeah, but I think you know since I'm a scientist, I think I'm allowed to dream a little bit. So I think the uh, yeah the regardless, we cannot do as high as lithium like a thousand. There's you no know, prototypes have shown one thousand watt hour per liter, but I think for sodium we should 
be able to reach one day, you know, six, seven hundred watt hour per liter. And that will be really good for those e-mobility that provided in countries that you don't need a lot of ranges, right? So for instance, India, you know, in, or in the metropolitan of Tokyo or Singapore, I think you really don't need the 500 miles per charge cars. Um, so I hope that the sodium batteries, I think, again, you know, China is already demonstrating some of the e-mobility cars in uh, on the road with the sodium batteries. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, it is very promising for me that to think about one day sodium batteries will be put into those um, cars. Um, I think, <laughs> of course, energy stationary storage you know um for sodium batteries the number one task we have to show is the safety that it needs to demonstrate a very very good safety record so everything is for sodium is just the beginning but uh, in the next one or two years i think you'll be very busy making videos about sodium battery i i think so i i hope so it's something i am excited about and uh the way i see it is at least the initial sodium ion batteries, it just seems absolutely ideal for grid storage due to scalability and cost and because it's uh, that volumetric energy density isn't as important. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I had a chat with, is it Darren, uh, Darren Tan of uh, Unigrid? Is that? Yes, uh, CEO. Uh, okay. Yeah, my former uh, student, former student. Yeah. Yeah, I had a chat with him and he got me really excited about the potential for sodium solid state batteries. And, and so um, bottom line would, uh, for a sodium solid state battery, would you be able to get a vehicle that has three to 400 miles of range, something like that? Yeah, in the most ideal case, I think mm -hmm. that can be done. Yeah, in, okay. I think a sodium solid state is, uh, you know, something, uh, somebody said, what, surely, sodium battery is so new. Solid, solid state is so new. You're putting the two together. Yeah, I said, yeah, putting the two impossible together, maybe it will become possible. So that, <laughs> that we, yeah, we really thought that uh, it's important for the people working in the battery field to keep think outside the box and the push it about boundaries because, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Nothing is impossible if you are not against the thermodynamic principles. I guess from my perspective, it seems like, uh, although it seems like you're compounding the difficulty by doing sodium and with like a solid state uh, type of battery, I think there, at least as I understand it, there's lots of advantages to like a sodium solid state battery because, uh, for instance, um, when you use that solid electrolyte material, you need a lot of the active ion in that uh, in order to make that, that viable. So uh, solid state lithium ion batteries are one of their roadblocks is that they're so expensive. Whereas if you're using a sodium ion chemistry, the active ion there is so cheap that you, you no longer have that barrier. So uh, you'd have super cheap solid state batteries that provide you with uh, a long range vehicle. That's that's why I'm excited about it. Yes, yeah. In fact, I've been criticized many times about uh, how much lithium is in the solid state batteries and can we provide the extra value because there's so much extra lithium. Yeah, so mm. that actually is one of the major driving force that for surely to think hard about how can I, you know, if I stuff a lot of sodium in the solid state that they will not complain then. Just to close things out, Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you're working on that you'd like to people people to know about, or what's the best way for people to follow you and keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, I'm pretty active on X, I guess, Twitter, previously known. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so if I want to champion for something right now, I just want people to realize, I know that hydrogen is very hot, yeah, but I want people to remember, even if hydrogen is successful, we will need a few hundred terawatt hour batteries. And we want all the people who are investing in the future of the planet to remember this. And we are asking trillion dollars investment in the infrastructure to build the batteries. And that also include the training of the students or the workforce, the talents. Yeah, so I think that uh, people need to keep the momentum going. I think that's why we'll keep tweeting on the Twitter <laughs> and the use linking. Uh, I think it's, extremely important that people, you know, not stopping the momentum because you think that the job is done because we are successful at scaling. 
Uh, we have a lot more to do. We only did two or three percent of the job. Absolutely. And I appreciate your time today. As I said at the beginning of the interview, it's always a privilege to talk to you. I got a lot of great insights, a lot of great video ideas. So, uh, yeah, thanks for your time. And I'll talk to you later. Until next time. Thank you, Jordan. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting the channel by using the links in the description. Also, consider following me on X. I often use X as a testbed for sharing ideas, and X subscribers like my Patreon supporters generally get access to my videos a week early.